Okay, well, uh, our next session is interestingly titled A New Investment Order. And uh, our presenter is, is James Kingston of BlackRock. Now, um, for those who are chasing bios and also the presentations, the presentations, if you, if you go to your QR code, you can now get the presentations as well. So if you're, if you're, it's a little bit difficult to see, you might be able to, to download it and then look there. Uh, James uh, conducts, uh, his team conducts customised outcome orientated client engagements uh, around portfolio construction and risk management, dealing with and assisting with asset allocation, structure and implementation decisions. And if you've read James's bio, you'll see he's uh, originally qualified as an astrophysicist and we we're having a chat before about how exciting uh, the Mars landing is. But unfortunately, he, uh, he qualified as an astrophysicist and then promptly got pinched across to the city because they were chasing people with his sort of background and paying a lot more money than I think astrophysicists were paid at that time. So uh, without further ado, please welcome James. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I was saying earlier, I literally had to dust off my suit this morning because it's been sitting in the wardrobe for so long. Um, so it's nice to see human beings and not screens. Um, today we're talking about what we're saying is a new investment order. Now we're not being sensationalist when we give it that title, but we think there is a, a fundamental reshaping um, of the investment landscape and of portfolio construction. Um, and that's what we want to try and address today. Um, so when we were discussing the content for this presentation, um, I was speaking to um, some of the IMAP guys and they said, can we focus on our portfolio is going to achieve what, they, what we want them to achieve going forward? Um, so if you look at like a typical CPI plus 5% portfolio over the, the long term, it obviously hasn't performed, um, but over shorter time horizons, depending on the discrete period of time you're looking at, it can and it has, especially over one year and three years. Um, so the question we're asking is, can we actually achieve that um, with our forward expectations and this new regime that we're currently going into? Um, and I think a lot of us are kind of dealing or grappling with, do we take more risk to achieve the, the, the returns or the, the yield that we want to achieve? Um, or do we kind of reduce down the expectations that we think we're going to achieve for the risk that we're currently taking? Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through some of the BlackRock Investment Institute um, views for this year, so our investment outlook, focus on the, the, the few key themes that we're honing in on, and then see how that's really um, implicated in portfolio construction and how we're changing our approach to building our asset allocations. So, I mean, if you think about what happened last year, um, COVID obviously dominated all of our mindsets, both socially, um, both in terms of the financial markets and economically. Um, but other things were also happening. We also went through bushfires in 2019, 2020 here, um, other weather events, um, social um, uh, protests in many countries around equality. Uh, we saw political landscape change, particularly in the US with the, with the election of Joe Biden. So a lot happened in 2020. Um, and the BII got together at the beginning of this year to discuss, you know, what are our views for 2021. And at the time, I think uh, Joe Biden was about to be inaugurated. Uh, we're at the, the peak of infections in both the US and Europe in terms of COVID. So it was an interesting time to be kind of putting out your view for 2021. I think what everybody agreed on is that we can't apply our normal business cycle rationale or methodology to the market environment today. This is fundamentally different. Um, and there's four key um, themes or four key dimensions that we were really assessing that were really driving the changes that we see. So firstly is around sustainability. Um, and when you first say sustainability, you think around climate change. So if you look at the extreme weather patterns that we've been experiencing globally, so the bushfires here, the, the big freeze in the US and what people are going through over there, um, flooding due to glacial melting in India, for example, there's lots of extreme weather patterns globally that are undeniable. And we're all grappling to think, how are we going to solve for this problem? Um, and that's partly helping flow, um, have capital flow into sustainable um, exposures. But also um, from a governance perspective and from a company perspective, I mean, many of us here are very lucky to be able to work remotely in our jobs. So when COVID hit last year, we could up sticks and move back to our homes. So there's a focus on companies to ensure that their employees are looked after and are safe during these sorts of periods. And that's kind of the governance and the G part of ESG, not something we normally consider. So that's the first big theme that's kind of driving a lot of um, what's happening. Um, secondly is uh, the spotlight um, and the magnification of global inequality, both within countries and across countries. 
if you look in many countries uh, and you can see some people have access to healthcare vaccines more than others. If you see about who lost their jobs in the, when we saw restrictions kick in last year, the, the inequality is very stark and very obvious to all of us. And then if you look across countries, um, obviously countries like Australia, the UK, developed na nations have access to vaccines more than emerging markets. And there are programs in place to help deal with that, but the equality, inequality between those countries is really, really stark. And some of those inequalities are gonna drive some policy decisions for many, uh, many countries and therefore you know, drive our investment theses. Um, thirdly, we're thinking about uh, what does the new world order look like and these two poles of growth globally. Um, so driven predominantly by the US and by China. And I think there were some topics of discussion around China earlier. Um, but obviously that's gonna shape what global policy looks like, uh, the debates between US and China on trade, et cetera. Um, we have to reflect what that looks like in our portfolios, ensuring that both those poles are represented in our portfolios. So we're actually generating returns um, from all areas of growth globally. And then last but not least, uh, I think something that's been talked about quite widely is the convergence or the working together of fiscal and monetary policy, which is something we haven't really seen before and it kind of makes a new landscape for us when we're thinking about constructing those portfolios. So those things are kind of driving what our themes are for this year, uh, and I think it's kind of agreed that this is um, still a new environment for us when we can't apply the old rule book to what's, um, to what's happening now. Um, but that leads us to this year's themes. Um, so we've got the new nominal, we've got globalization rewired, um, and if I can say this without uh, twisting my tongue, turbocharged transformations. Um, those are the three things that are kind of driving uh, our views for this year. So I think there's been discussion around inflation already today. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of re-emphasize what everybody else is really saying. Um, the new nominal for us isn't just the situation where inflation can run higher. It's also the fact that a lot of central banks are saying they're not gonna ra um, raise, ra uh, raise rates in reaction to that. So we're going to a potential environment where we're gonna have higher long run inflation, um, still low rates, and that's gonna support growth assets to a degree. Um, so we're very much underweight government bonds in the US and in other markets uh, and pro-risk assets for that reason. And we'll touch on that a little bit later, but our expectations on, on inflation are markedly higher than what the market is currently pricing in. Um, so the US is kind of north of 25 and the Eurozone just under 2.5% in terms of inflation expectations for 2025 to 2030. Second theme is around globalization rewind, and this kind of goes back to um, the two poles of growth that we see globally, so China and the US. Um, if you look at how the world has been rewired um, in terms of supply chains, a lot of countries, including those two big economies, are kind of focusing on domestic production of key items rather than relying on global supply chains. Um, so that's focusing on um, resilience rather than, you know, at the expense of, in, uh, of efficiencies. And the case for China in a portfolio is growing um, by the day. So by 2025, we're expecting more than 20% of global GDP to be um, from China. Um, so the strategic implication of this is actually an over benchmark weight to China in our portfolios and being very selective about the markets that we're investing into within emerging markets. Last but not least, uh, turbocharged transformations. I'm still saying that correctly, which is a relief. Um, I think if you see what happened in, in 2020, there's a lot of themes that got accelerated because of COVID and because of the measures that were put in place. Um, most obviously and most notably is the increased rise of digital shopping, um, online shopping, and the decrease of popularity of retail sales and retail shopping. Um, so that's been accelerated by the fact that we've been locked down, we've been um, put in, our, we can't leave our houses to go shopping. Um, the other things I mentioned around inequality uh, as, as another uh, turbocharged transformation with that under the spotlight. And then lastly, uh, sustainable assets as being the go-to or preferred method for implementing portfolios going forward. Um, and I'll touch on some of the, of the reasons um, why we think that's the case later. Um, so that's certainly the strategic implication. And on that note, um, we're actually releasing our updated capital market assumptions um, this week on Friday, and we're shifting our whole framework on portfolio construction to be sustainability focused. So they're climate aware CMAs. So we're kind of moving away from the traditional non-climate aware to being more focused on the E premium that you can get in ESG and how that kind of impacts asset allocation. Um, so I don't have those numbers to present today. I, didn't, I wasn't allowed to get a sneak preview, um, but we were releasing that on Friday. So all these things have a noticeable impact on the way that we think about constructing our portfolios. Some things have not changed. Um, so if you've seen me present before, um, this diagram is something that I, I continually use. It's, we're all strike, trying to strike the balance of the objectives of our clients. They may be changing due to the current environment. Um, the costs have become 
even more of a focus now, making sure we're getting value for money in the portfolios that we're investing. But risks are obviously changing. And if we're going to allocate to different asset classes within um, our asset allocation, then we have to have a handle on the risks that we're, that we're taking within that portfolio. Then the additional things that we obviously have to imply over the top of that, liquidity needs have become important last year, and I think they're going to be important going forward. So ensuring that we've actually got liquidity in our portfolios to rebalance, to manage that in crisis events, particularly in the fixed income sphere, when actually holding on to single securities can, um, can be fairly illiquid. And then sustainability requirements are becoming more important for all of our clients um, as they look forward to um, building their portfolios. And indeed, the process that we take is still exactly the same. We haven't changed that process. Just I think within each of those steps, we're getting a little bit more granular and a little bit more focused. So the benchmark phase, which is asset allocation, still the very important phase of, of, the, of the process of constructing portfolios. Um, but we're getting far more granular on the asset classes and being far more creative about the asset classes that we can invest into. And I'll touch on what those are, are shortly. Um, budgeting still exists, so where we're willing to take active risk. Investing, we'll come, I think what we saw last year is that a lot of investors are really focusing on picking the best strategies and picking the best managers because the market performance that we saw really sorted out the cream from the crop. And then lastly, monitoring, again, become even more important for, through what we saw in 2020 um, with the risk spikes um, and the market performance. So these four steps haven't changed. I think we're just taking a little bit more emphasis on some of these steps to actually adjust our portfolios for what we see as being the new regime going forward. Asset allocation is still going to be driving the majority of that risk and return in portfolios. Um, and thus, you know, what we're relying on when we're constructing that is the capital market assumptions that we're putting forward. Now, these are end of last year, so obviously they're going to update this year, uh, this month, this week, sorry. Um, but if you can see that, I think a lot of these views are reflected in what we've already discussed today. So over the f next five years, the expected return on a lot of fixed income asset classes should be or expected to be um, zero or close to zero. Um, so therefore, we're seeing a lot of clients kind of push up the risk of their asset allocation and moving into um, more high yield, more emerging, emerging market debt, etc. cetera. Um, we're also seeing a huge shift into um, uh, alternative asset classes. Um, so real assets if we can, if not hedge fund strategies and fund of hedge funds to kind of get that diversification benefit and also other areas of growth. And then being more, a bit more discerning about equities as well and where we invest and what markets we invest into. So there's four things I'm going to touch on and again kind of re-emphasizing what has, has been discussed already. So um, a new playbook for inflation um, and that kind of sings to the tune of we're expecting inflation to go up. Um, the market is not currently pricing in an increase in inflation. Oh, beg your pardon. So if you look at the break-even rate versus the nominal rate versus the actual real yield at the moment, the market's not pricing in, at least in the US, an increase in inflation. Um, but we think that is going to ha be happening in, the, in, the, in at least the next few years. So strategically, that's an opportunity within portfolio construction to kind of build that into your portfolio. And if you think that it could potentially be a risk, actually try and mitigate that risk or hedge for that risk wherever you can. Um, so. I've spoken to a few of you today talking about trades in commodities or inflation-linked um, inflation securities or sectors that will kind of give you that inflation protection. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that currently happening. But it also has um, an impact for how we structure our portfolios. I'm missing a slide. I'm going to continue. Um, so the second thing was around diversification. So we talked about the two poles of growth around China and the US. Um, that redefines what we mean by diversification in portfolios. So normally a well-diversified portfolio um, will have access to global markets. Most portfolios that we see and most investors are underweight China or don't have actually any allocation to China whatsoever. And we think there's a case for that to be included within portfolios. If you look at China bonds, for example, the yield on China bonds are currently around 3.3% uh, on government bonds, that is. So in comparison to other developed market government bond yields, they're, they're far superior. Yes, there are additional risks in investing in China, um, most notably um, the, the, just the, the political discussions between the US and China, uh, the valuation of the yuan relative to the uh, US dollar. Um, default risk, for example. But the up, uptick that you get in yield is compensating for the additional risks that you may be taking there. And so we would advocate for an above benchmark allocation to China within portfolios at the expense of some of those other global bond exposures, not only to in increase um, the potential yield, but also to manage your risk. 
So in reality, if you look at the correlation of um, China bonds relative to other asset classes, um, not looking at uh, FX risks there, there's a very low correlation to corporate bonds and to global government bonds and a, a strong negative correlation to equities. So it provides a very good diversification benefit within portfolios. So we think there is a case for that to be made for to include above benchmark weights within China. Um, indeed, we looked at a small case study and looked at a very simple 60-40 portfolio. Um, and by increasing or by including a small allocation to China bonds, we've reduced the risk quite significantly, <coughs> up the return um, by 0.8 or the expectation of return, um, and also given us the potential to increase our yield over what would be Australian composite bond yields around 0.8. Um, so we think there's a, a strong case for the inclusion of China um, within portfolios. Now, thirdly is the what we're saying tectonic shift to sustainability. And if any, anybody saw the letter from our CEO, Larry Fink, this year and last year, there's a huge focus on actually holding companies accountable to actually better um, our, our carbon footprints and actually try and solve for the problem that we have with climate change. Um, but that's only one of the reasons why we see this shift into ESG. So I think if you look at institutional clients, um, a lot more are focused on integrating ESG metrics into their portfolio construction process. Um, for many, that's been happening for a while. If you look within supers, there's been a lot of exclusion criteria that have always been present, but now there's more of an ingrained process around actually optimizing ESG exposures within the portfolio. Um, individual investors are also becoming far more discerning about what they invest. Um, so actually investing in more positive companies that are going to have a, a positive impact or screening out for companies that are going to have a negative impact. And then lastly, this mounting realization that, that we've got an enormous task to deal with climate change, um, and that's by governments and by corporates alike. So those three things are really moving the dial in terms of reallocation of capital into sustainable assets. And we think this is going to be playing out over the next 10 to 20 years. It's not going to be like a short-term thing. It's going to be you know, slowly eking across. Um, but if you look at the flows of ESG products in 2020, around $350 billion went into ESG products globally relative to around 140, 150 in 2019. So you know, the views that we're talking about are really being realized in the flows into products that we've been seeing over the last 12 months. Initially, there was a discussion around, am I going to be losing returns with ESG? And I think that why not moment arrived a couple of years ago. And we really dispelled the myths around, actually, you're not going to lose return potential by investing into ESG. If anything, you actually enhance it. Um, and you expose yourself to companies with a higher ESG score. Um, so that got dispelled a couple of years ago. And since then, we've kind of seen the flows into the products really accelerate. And COVID and 2020 was one of the main catalysts that really drove those flows forward. I'll touch on a brief case study because my role, as was explained, is to kind of work with our clients on when they're building their portfolio. So I'll work with a lot of you when you're constructing your portfolios to provide our insights from a research risk and um, product perspective. Um, one client we worked with recently was trying to build a sustainability-friendly portfolio but had a tilt towards um, climate betterment or you know, uh, low carbon, um, trying to kind of show an improvement on, um, uh, on climate change going forward. So we can do that fairly easily with some of our uh, optimized and screened products um, that we have listed globally, but then overlaying some more thematic impact-like uh, strategies in there as well. So, um, for example, global water, uh, timber, sustainable energy, for example. Um, and there's a few questions around sustainable energy because the flows into those products have been so high that valuations are looking incredibly stretched. Um, and that is a risk that a lot of uh, investors have to be very wary of. Um, but the, the wider shift into sustainability is going to happen over a longer time horizon. So with that, we can obviously take a portfolio and vastly improve the ESG score. Um, but one of the metrics that we look at um, with sustainability is carbon footprint. Um, and in this particular case, the impact um, thematic funds that we were looking at actually had a very high carbon footprint. Uh, and the reason for that is a lot of the companies that are investing in some of these active strategies will have diversified energy firms that will be supplying energy from traditional um, hydrocarbon businesses, but also building sustainable energy businesses as part of their wider, longer-term remit. In that case, the numbers are not netted off. So what you actually get is a carbon footprint that looks really, really high, even if the companies are involved in sustainable activities. Um, and that will be remedied in two ways. I think sustainable uh, data providers like MSCI and Sustainalytics are going to have more of a focus on netting out those numbers to actually show which companies are making a difference. And then secondly, as these technologies and the supply of this energy actually takes up, then the carbon footprint will decrease. So it's kind of one something that you need to be, you need to be aware of this when you, if you're building portfolios for your clients that are sustainability focused. There's a story there to build a portfolio where companies are invested in technologies that are going to improve this going forward, but immediately right now it might look like there's a higher carbon score. 
but the narrative is still there. The numbers at the moment might not add up if, you're, if you need to kind of present that to your clients. So a great example of why sustainability is important, but just beware the optics um, when you're talking to your clients. The other notion around uh, sustainable exposures is being very granular in your asset allocation. So obviously on a sector by sector basis, some sectors look better from an ESG perspective than others. Um, and indeed, some sectors look better um, from a positioning perspective in the, the point we are in the cycle as well. So take granular views when you're thinking about sustainability. You, you can look broadly for your core, but then think uh, you know, on a, on a, on a sector or on a country basis, which will have very different characteristics from an ES, with an ESG lens. And all the analytics that you saw on the last page is something that we can do for our clients and we do on an ongoing basis to kind of provide those insights and those ideas. Um, so just moving to the, the very last part, and that's on private markets, and I think there's a, a bit of a panel discussion about this later. Very difficult to invest into for many of us, um, but we are seeing a huge shift from clients moving from um, public markets into private markets for reasons of diversification and for opening up opportunities to new sources of return and yield. Um, and predominantly, we've seen a huge shift in institutional portfolios moving away from government bonds into um, kind of private markets. So if you look at the traditional or a, a typical super fund, you know, north of 25% will be in these sorts of asset classes. Um, there are opportunities there. So if you look at the amount of outstanding debt in 2020 relative to 2007, it's increased almost threefold. Um, and if companies come out of the COVID um, environment in, in the short term, many will look to the private markets to restructure their debt. So there's going to be more opportunities going forward. Um, it is a bit of a caution that we have to kind of think about is you have to be very selective of the manager you are choosing to implement this. They have to have the right relationships, the right skills to be able to manage the risks that are part of investing in this asset class. Um, and for those of us who can't get access to these asset classes, we're seeing a rise in the usage of hedge funds and fund of hedge fund strategies um, to give that diversification benefit, but also provide different um, growth um, potential as well within portfolios. So I'm about to um, run out of time, so I'm just going to sum up very briefly um, by looking back at that kind of CPI question. Um, and we've taken two very vanilla asset allocations, um, so a balanced portfolio and a growth portfolio, invested in international and domestic fixed income and equity, and applied our capital market assumptions that we had as of the end of last year. And the balance was expected to return around 3.9 and 5.01 for the growth over the next 10 years. Um, no doubt a lot of you are saying that's fairly conservative. I think when you look at capital market assumptions, they're always conservative. It's better to be conservative than overpromise. Um, but indeed, that's not going to hit our target of CPI plus five. I mean, if you take the, the guidance on CPI, we, we want to hit anywhere between seven and eight percent. So we're, we're, we're falling short there. Um, if we then make changes based on the themes we just talked about, so if we take out our government bond allocation and put in inflation protected securities, if we take out um, some of our growth and defensive assets and put in some alternatives, just an equally weighted basket of alternative strategies. And then lastly, if we sell down some of our international bonds and put in China, we can actually get to a re expected return, which is around 5% for the balanced portfolio, around 6.4 for the um, more growthy portfolio. Now, indeed, we're going to have to be a bit more creative around the managers that we're choosing or the securities that we're choosing. Um, but we're eking up to that kind of that target level. Whether we're going to achieve it or not is still remains to be seen. So I know that's not an answer for you, um, but we're getting close to that kind of target return. Um, so just to kind of summarize what we've just discussed, um, if we think about the new investment order and where we're going, um, be, aware, be aware of inflation risks. Consider mitigating or managing for that risk using inflation protected securities, commodities, et cetera. Um, there is a huge shift into sustainability uh, as an asset allocation framework. Um, so we believe that that's going to be um, happening over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, and indeed, the capital market assumptions that we're about to release really supports that narrative of baking it into um, portfolio construction. Thirdly, um, use of alternatives as an alternative to, um, again, diversification in the portfolio uh, rather than government bonds. And then last but not least, actually giving China its uh, ability to kind of take more of a, a seat in the portfolio above benchmark, which will hopefully improve risk and return um, characteristics of portfolios. So that's been kind of a whirlwind tour of our views. Uh, it normally takes us an hour just to present the views and not the implementation. So I've kind of gone through pretty quickly. And I think we run out of time. So have we got time for questions? Yeah. Questions? Yep. Don't all ask at once. <laughs>
um, just with the analysis on ESG, yep. um, that analysis went from 2012, I think, to now. Yep. Um, just obviously in that period, um, it's been a very growth tech um, pro market, and ESG tends to t tilt you towards those sectors. Yep. Um, if you do that analysis longer term, obviously it's not as um, great. Would you say that's more of a growth tech sort of push, or is it more a fact that people are more aware of it and taking uh, closer, paying closer attention to it? So, are you, are you asking whether ESG is more of a tech? Yeah. Play? So, if you look at the fads, if you look at like the, the flows in the last sort of six, seven years, obviously, yep. if you do any sort of ESG analysis, you'll find that like it, it looks pretty good yep. um, because of ESG screens tend to favour tech and growth areas. Yep. If you do that analysis over 20, 30 years. Yep. Um, it's not as not as promising. Uh, it still looks okay. It doesn't just doesn't look terrible. Yep. Um, but obviously, in that, that broader or that longer term period, growth and tech weren't as sort of front and centre. So, just as you strip out those factors, um, how prominent is that ESG benefit in portfolios? So there's different levels to this question. So it depends on how you implement your ESG. Um, you can screen, um, which will be kind of getting rid of some of the, the companies and sectors that you don't want. And that will kind of probably lean to a bias more kind of to those, to those segments with a higher um, ESG score. And tech does have that, and so does banks and financials. Um, if you then move to more optimized um, or more you know, best-in-class SRI exposures, then yeah, you, you, you will kind of skew the, the sectors ever so slightly. Um, you can then impart like impact investing on top and a lot of the impact investing is tech. If you look at clean energy, solar, wind, they're all tech related functions. Um, so you are kind of like overstacking on that particular segment quite a lot. Um, but indeed, if you want to take more of a broad based exclusion approach, then you don't have that kind of sector biases. And indeed, I think a lot of the, the products that we have uh, uh, and our competitors have actually have um, constraints on it to make sure you're not getting huge sector biases in the portfolio. Um, so I think when you see the numbers coming out this week, you will see an e-premium um, that we're pricing into the capital market assumption. So we do believe that is the case, and that will probably play out over the next decade or so. Yeah. Um, us particularly. Um, so we've got a lot of alternative funds ourselves, which we, we obviously offer to a lot of institutional clients. Um, I think if you look within our multi-asset portfolios, we took a position on gold last year. Um, some of our multi-asset strategies will have fund of hedge fund exposures in there. Um, and they, pro they, they provide like equity-like returns for less risk. So they're a good diversifier, but they also provide uh, decent returns. Obviously, not through every single cycle. Um, but at the moment, we're advocating for that to kind of diversify our risk away from the government bonds, which are providing less of a buffer in the portfolio than they used to. Uh, James, could you repeat the question because it's, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, the question was um, with your CPI plus, if say if you're a balanced investor, is the end investor taking on more risk to yes. achieve those returns? I know yep. that's not a critical of the product, it's, it's a thing that every investor is having to take on across the market. So I'm just interested in your thoughts there on on that uh, angle. There's definitely an uptick, uptick in risk. And I think if we look back earlier when we we're talking about inflation, um, our expectations on equity market returns are higher because... Um, the discount rate is affected by the interest rates, obviously. Um, our expectation on tips is high, and our expectation on government bonds is not as low as it used to be. Um, so I think our portfolios have kind of shift to more equity heavy, less government bond heavy. So there is an additional risk in that inherently. Um, and yes, if you want more returns, you need to take more risk. Um, I don't think we've discovered the free lunch yet. It might be out there somewhere. Sorry, James, I've just got a question going back to your CPI plus five again. Yeah. Uh, you're obviously making a few changes there that are outside the realm of what would normally be classified as a, an SAA type of portfolio, yep. including different asset classes, building out the, uh, the alternatives and things like that. Yep. So I just wanted to get the house view on how important you think, or how likely is an SAA portfolio going to be able to hit these things, or do you have to move more to a DAA type of approach? open up, broaden up the range of asset classes you can get into. Yep. I mean, what's the house for you as, as to what the general industry is doing versus what's needed to be done going forward? Well, I think what we're advocating for is a change to SAA, um, to actually open up to more asset classes, which is why we've included alternatives in that particular asset um, allocation, why we've included China. Um, so those changes are necessary to deal with the fact that, you know, we can't rely on some other asset classes to provide us the risk or return that we, that we need. Um, certainly, we're seeing a lot of clients trying to do DAA or TAA, but it's also very difficult in a very rapidly changing environment to do that. Um, but at, at the base case, what we're saying here is expand your remit of asset classes that you can invest into um, to provide you with you know, a wider product set to actually achieve your outcomes. Other questions? 
Um, I, I have a question particularly about um, uh, Chinese equities um, yes. and the, the, way, the way in which, you know, the type of portfolio that's represented in this room, you know, mum and dad with $600,000, um, the, the way in which they can practically um, get that exposure. To Chinese equities. Well, since that's going to be a sort of a one yep. of your two poles for future growth. Yeah. Um, so if you look at uh, emerging market benchmarks, China's around 40% of MSCI EM. But the majority of that is um, offshore. So, you know, through Hong Kong, or through other listing locations. China A was included a couple of years ago um, at a very low inclusion level. So we'd expect that to tick up over time. Um, to, to get access, you can actually buy China A exposures offshore. I don't think you can access it um, via Australia. Um, but indeed, if you buy emerging markets, you can also get access. Um, but we are kind of cautioning that if you invest into emerging markets, be a little bit more granular in your exposures. I think if you look at the performance of emerging markets last year, um, emerging markets in Asia performed very well. Emerging markets in, uh, in, in Europe and Latin America and Africa did not. Um, partly due to their reaction due to COVID. I think Asia's got COVID well under control compared to other Western markets. Um, so, you know, be granular if you can. Um, China exposures exist um, in the market. There's not very many in Australia. There's, there's a lot more uh, globally, um, but there are ways to access that. But just be aware that there is a difference between onshore China A shares and, and, and offshore through Hong Kong. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much, James. I think that was a, a really succinct and interesting presentation. And well done to the floor for the quality of the questions. Uh, some good questions. It's more of a sort of cup of coffee does to, to fire up the brain cells, get you moving. Uh, our next presentation uh, is a, a panel discussion uh, entitled Asset Allocation Challenges and Features in Managed Accounts. It's um, moderated by Michael Karagiannis, the Michael Parkinson of the industry in terms of moderating panel sessions. He needs no introduction to any of you, uh, so I'll just call on Michael to come forward and kick things off. Thank you. I've seen some of Michael Parkinson's interviews. That's a backhander if ever I heard one now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure actually, and perhaps a little disconcerting to be talking to a live audience, uh, having been uh, spending the last year talking to a virtual audience and now actually having to wear pants for meetings. That's uh, quite uh, unusual as well. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, certain faux pas over the course of the last year uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, this session, AA challenges and features in managed accounts really, I think, has in part been covered by some of the previous speakers, so we can go back over some of those points. Uh, we've got a, a great team up here. Um, what we're going to do is ask them to come up and talk for two or three minutes individually just to give a perspective, and then we're going to get into a panel discussion. We've broken it up into two sections. The first section is really talking more philosophically about how would you run an AA process? What sort of resourcing do you need? Is it viable for a an advice business to insource that, or is it something that realistically should be outsourced? What sort of resourcing, not just from a personal uh, personnel perspective, but also from a technology perspective, uh, would be required for that? The other is, I guess, a more contemporaneous perspective. You know, what do you think about asset allocation at this point in time? What are some of the ideas that people should be looking at? Obviously, uh, the previous session covered a little bit of that, but we can touch on some of those points as well. So joining me up on the stage, uh, we have uh, two panellists, uh, Piers Bolger, uh, CIO for uh, Infinity and Viridian. Uh, prior to that, uh, Piers uh, worked with uh, BT Investment Solutions, and prior to that, uh, Piers and I actually both worked at the same shop uh, many years ago. I'd hate to think how long ago that was, Piers, um, over 20 years, I'm sure, uh, UBS Global Asset Management. Um, and also joining me um, is our clerk of MLC, Head of Investments there. And our clerk has uh, got a lot of experience both domestically and offshore, working with uh, retail institutional clients. Previously, uh, Global Head of Multi-Asset with Nico Asset Management, and then prior to that, uh, Head of Multi-Asset Asia Pack with Schroeder's Investment Management. So really, in terms of introducing this section, um, I wanted to give a couple of slides to really set the scene. Um, and. The first of those, um, and I think BlackRock uh, covered that uh, to an extent uh, recently uh, in their presentation, 
Uh, this is just some research that was done back in the 90s. I mean, this was landmark research at the time. It's pretty much conventional wisdom, but really what is the impact on portfolios from the way you go about making decisions? What is the most important levers that you can pull in diminishing order of uh, importance? The first of those is really setting the objectives uh, and getting the AA, SAA right. So we talked a little bit in the previous session about uh, SAA versus dynamic asset allocation. Those two first sections there, which really account for probably almost 90% of the total value add, both in terms of incremental returns as well as diminution of risk, uh, can be dealt with by getting the SAA framework right. The, th the third box is really your dynamic or tactical asset allocation. That's where you're actively tilting around that SAA to try and extract value or steer away from risk with various asset classes. And then the fourth and the least significant is decisions such as active versus passive managers, what sort of managers you want to incorporate within your portfolio. It's an interesting observation. This is conventional wisdom. It's not really been challenged. There's been a lot of research since then. Our observation is from many investment committees, the actual time and energy expanded uh, or expelled in an investment committee is often inversely related to this. Most people spend a lot of time talking about manager decision making, um, stock selection, talking about the dynamic asset allocation tilts that they want to introduce, you find that they can add value, but it's more incremental. A good asset allocation, um, dynamic asset allocation process might add one to one and a half percent per annum. Perhaps stock selection, if you're getting it right, to manager selection, another one percent if you're doing really well. But most of it is really going to be driven by your SOA. So that's a, a fundamental principle. I'd like to uh, uh, ask our panelists to really uh, share their thoughts on that. And the other is, it's not just the decisions you make, but how quickly you implement them. And this is some research that uh, Philo Capital Managers were very uh, happy and, and, and uh, kind to uh, offer us. But it showed that, uh, you know, really the cost of delay is quite significant. You can have really good ideas, but if you don't introduce them across all your clients in a very timely manner, which is really the, the thesis of a managed account process, being able to pull the lever centrally and have that flow out into all client portfolios, then you're really dispersing the value of making that decision in the first place. And it can be actually quite significant over a period of only four weeks, you can actually use 50% of the potential value add that you might have got from having a great idea. So with that in mind, I'll ask Piers to come up to the podium first and uh, just share his thoughts for two or three minutes about uh, you know their views on how they go about it, how important asset allocation is, and then Al, and then we'll sit down and have a bit more of a panelist discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and uh, well, afternoon, everyone. So you can tell Mike and I have um, obviously worked together because our slides are going to be quite similar in the context. But um, how do we deal with the asset allocation challenge? And you know, from our point of view, there's really four key areas that we think about. First and foremost is around having a process around your asset allocation framework, and you know, we certainly believe that that really underpins your ability to be able to deal with different market environments and to be able to have that backstop in order for you to, to make changes if you think it's appropriate, as, as well as obviously deal with the framework that supports your asset allocation, whether it be in terms of manager selection or security selection on that front. The second one is around implementation, and you know that chart there that Mike just showed I think is a fantastic one, the ability to implement on your portfolios. And I think when we look at it from a managed account point of view, that's actually been a significant advantage relative to what we've seen in a more traditional framework where portfolios may be implemented by an individual advisor. And quite often in that context, they often start with their biggest client and then work their way down. The advantage of implementation through a managed account framework is that you're dealing it with all clients at a single moment in time. The third point, and I think this goes back to, again, through the Black Product presentation, is the ability to have a broad church in the context of your investment universe. We're a big believer in the context of being able to get as granular as you can without sort of over diversification within the portfolio framework, but being able to have as many quivers to your bow in the context of actually how you manage that portfolio and the asset allocation framework. And then finally, and probably most importantly, is your asset allocation actually adding value? So you've got to be able to measure it. You've got to be able to take that attribution rather than just assume that you're doing a good job when indeed you actually might not be doing that at all. 
So just the way that we look at it, um, again, very similar, I think, to a number of other speakers, so I don't know if that's good or bad, but in the context of, you know, we split into two sort of key distinct areas. One, having that strategic framework, so that's underpinned by the capital markets assumption that a number of people have spoken about today. Creating an, the investment objectives for your portfolios, not all portfolios, sure to do have the same investment objectives, but looking at that in the context of what you're trying to achieve. And then building a framework around that, and our strategic framework in that context is ensuring can we, through the journey of time, based upon the work that we've done in terms of our capital markets, achieve the outcomes that we want for those portfolios. The right-hand side of it then really comes around how do we want to manage risk in the context of those portfolios over the journey? Because you know, certainly in our view, a set and forget strategy over a really long duration might hit what you're trying to achieve, but markets don't behave in a normal manner as we well know. So the ability to be able to to make changes in order to manage that risk through time, we think is really important. So your investment configuration comes into play. We've had a lot of speakers already talk about the types of uh, allocation that you want. Portfolio implementation, again, timing. We're not big into timing, but we do think it's important to be cognizant of the market environment and then ongoing portfolio management. So that's how we sort of break that, that nexus and whether it be tactical or dynamic, depending upon people's views. But underpinning all of that, as I said, is how do we manage risk? Um, our core philosophy is if you get less wrong, then through time compound interest will do that, that heavy lifting. And so it's, it's more around the incremental nature as opposed to trying to hit home runs um, all the time. And this really just highlights that point probably over the last 12 months. So this is just showing your asset allocation on our balance portfolio throughout um, pretty much 2020. And just a couple of points to note on that point. One, the implementation piece, um, you know, through that February, March period, we were able to make those decisions quite quickly when we felt that obviously things were going um, potentially to hell in a handbasket. And really when the Fed stepped in and started buying, buying treasuries, we could e equally then start to say, is there a flaw to the market environment and could we make the changes back to making changes within our portfolio? And you, know, you can see there throughout the journey of 2020, again, to the point that Mike was making before, it's really that imp in, um, incremental build that we were really trying to build into the portfolio rather than say, simply saying, we think we're out of this environment, we'll go for a swing to the, the hills. That's not the way that we thought about it, nor the way that we think um, is best to create, um, as I said, real value in order um, to create those long-term objectives that you're trying to achieve. The other point to note when we just think about um, growth and defensive, and I think more so on the defensive side of things, um, you know, even when you're looking at alternative assets, even when you're looking at you know, property as an example, there are some clear asset classes that have some quite significant income generative capabilities, as well as obviously asset classes that have quite a lot of interest rate sensitivity built into them. So when we think about that component part, whether it be in defensive and or growth, you know, we do look to marry those, those elements in, in the way that we then build out our asset allocation. And that leads us into the third aspect there, having a, um, this chart really probably, if you look at it, makes a hell of a lot of sense, but in the context of you know, the building blocks that we utilise within our portfolios and the ability for us to be able to try and identify opportunity sets. And again, I think it goes back to actually one of Angela's first questions that she asked the, the panel here, is the ability to be able to implement on platforms and the ability for platforms to be able to um, create an environment where you can actually have a really well-functioning managed account. And you know, from our personal view, that has been a, a challenge across the market and hopefully um, we'll see some, you know, that being resolved as platforms start to evolve. But as I said, I think that it's one of the more important points. And again, James's session just gone is around how, to, how do you build out and how do you create those, those opportunities. And I think that that, from our point of view, um, certainly has been, been a positive element in terms of the way we go about it. And then ultimately, in terms of, you know, you've got to measure your performance. And um, you can see there, if you sort of look through, particularly obviously back in the first quarter of last year, obviously we saw that, you know, there was a dip clearly. Um, that dip was far, you know, less than half of what the A6200 fell, but clearly we had a, an imp implication there in terms of performance. You've got to acknowledge that. But I think the ability to be able to move out of that was, you know, an adjunct of the way that we've gone about the process. And from our point of view, we do believe that you can add value um, through time. It's going to be incremental to Michael's point, but it can create value for clients on that basis. So with that, I'll um, hand over to Al. Afternoon, everyone. This is the most people I've been around for like 12 months. I've seemed nervous, not so much the public speaking, it's just this is a bit confronting being so intimate with so many people. 
Um, so Michael earlier talked about the most important decision. So why is asset allocation important and the most important decision? I think he, he framed it exactly right. The first one is getting the member into or the client into the right risk bucket cohort. That'll dictate their outcomes for the number of years. So we don't really control that bit. Our bit is then once that's been made and that decision's been made, okay, how do we now maximise that outcome? So we've decided they want to be in 70% growth, 30% defensive. How do we now maximise that? That's our important decision. Oops. And that's where we sort of, hopefully we can start to add some skill. Now, as I was reflecting on this, I don't want to take up too much time, but as I was reflecting on this presentation today, I was thinking there's, there's been environments, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, there's been environments where asset allocation, it's not easy, I'm not going to pretend it's easy, but it has been easier. And it's been easier because when you're making a decision to move out of certain assets into other assets for a reason, such as we thought equities were expensive in 1998, we'd move into bonds, Bonds were at least giving us 7%, or US bonds were giving 7%, Aussie bonds were giving maybe a little bit less than that. In 2007, again, you thought equities were expensive, you'd move into something defensive, bonds were giving you 5%. At least when you were looking at that asset allocation relative decision, it's all relative, there was something on the other side. You could move out of something, but there was something on the other side. Now, we're all aware of this, and I actually missed some of the earlier presentations, I'm sure it's been covered. Right now, there's nothing on the other side. If you want to get out of growth, there's nowhere else to go. So it's just a really challenging environment for asset allocation. So I listened to James from BlackRock earlier talking about broadening out, and Piers just said having a broad church. Broadening out the mechanisms and the things at your disposal feels really important now just because there's nothing on the other side. You need to find ways of embedding defensiveness, embedding other types of carry or ways of getting yield into your portfolio because the majority of stuff that you used to invest in just provides you with asymmetric returns and no carry or no yield. So it does feel, in that context, it does feel quite challenging. So I just thought I'd go, in the, in the short time I've got to start with, I thought I'd quickly just run through an example. Here, here's our asset allocation process, just in higher level theory. We do, we're active asset allocators, that shouldn't be a surprise. I think where we probably add a bit of value is rather than just looking at assets, we try to think about what I was just saying. We try to think how can we customise or look outside the box, be a bit innovative in how we're trying to get some of those different assets and different roles that things can play into our portfolio. And the way we make all these decisions is through a thing we call the invest, this is MLC's Investment Futures Framework. Uh, very briefly, it's looking at a range of potentially credible scenarios, thinking of the probability of those occurring and how will our assets behave in those scenarios and then maximising that trade-off. So I thought I could just do a quick example. So what's something we're worrying about right now? Well, uh, from what I can understand from what's just been said in the last half hour, inflation's been a topic today. We're worried about inflation. I'm not just going to suggest inflation is a slam dunk. I don't know if inflation's going to pop up, but our probability of inflation occurring is definitely increased. And one of the good things about that is that it's cheap to hedge against. So a lot of what we're looking to buy into our portfolios for deflation or disinflation is quite expensive. Tech's expensive, bonds are expensive, all those sorts of things. Duration of any asset, any asset that's got duration is expensive. On the other side, things that don't have duration, things with cyclical flows, they're a bit cheaper, value equities, emerging markets, those sorts of things. So we've got a, a situation right now where something we're worried about, which is inflation, is actually not too expensive to hedge against. So what do we do? This is, our, this is one of our model portfolios. We're talking about SMAs, so the separately managed accounts. Here's our sort of mid-range one, so the, the assertive. And in this account, you can see some of the things we've adjusted recently to try and get some of these cyclical cash flows in. And hopefully during the question time, we sort of tease out this inflation issue. But one of the things we're looking to get in is obviously some sort of inflation-linked or cyclical cash flows. So as you can see there, we've increased, the, the, the number one equity we hold actually is BHP. So there's no more <laughs> inflation linked than the real cash flows from a miner, right? So the, the number one equity is BHP. That's one way of getting it in. We also increased our exposure to a global value manager. So value equities tend to be more cyclical, more financials, more energy, those sorts of things. Again, certain implicit inflation links. So we increased that. We also added a dedicated emerging market exposure through a Walter Scott. And then finally, uh, the more defensive side of it. So we're adding in these cyclical things, but as I said, there's not much on the other side as far as defence goes. How do we get defensiveness in? Reducing duration is an obvious one, but what we actually use is a proprietary product we call Inflation Plus. Happy to talk at length, but I don't think I'll be allowed to. <laughs> Where we embed certain protective mechanisms and defensive components. So we use that as a way of getting defensiveness. It delivers 
our expectation is a real yield somewhere in the order of 4 or 5%. That helps us to try and accommodate the fact that nowhere else are we getting that type of trade-off when we try and be defensive. So that's all I really wanted to talk about, just sort of set the scene that I think at the moment things are a little bit harder than they have been. As I said, it's almost 30 years in, it does feel quite, quite challenging at the moment. Uh, and it's really about, I think some other people have been saying this, let's try and broaden out and be innovative about the way we use asset allocation. So I'll stop there and hand back to Mike. Well, thank you. Um, so as I said before, we're going to divide this up into two sections. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll just skip over the first one and, and give it uh, some, some reasonable thought, but not go into too much detail perhaps, but philosophical discussion. Um, you know, how hard is it to run an asset allocation process? Both of you have indicated how important it is. Um, everyone has a view about asset allocation. Um, it's the sort of thing that, you know, you share thoughts around, you know, barbecues and so on and so forth. But there's a difference between having a, a view and actually having to run it within a portfolio. It's a very tough discipline and in fact, the evidence suggests that there's not a lot of practitioners out there that have a good long-term record in terms of delivering positive value and perhaps risk reduction from asset allocation. So what, in your views, do you think are required to, to make it a success of it? Perhaps, Piers, you want to kick off? Well, I'd, I'd agree with you, it is hard. Um, and if you think about it in the context, uh, if you've got security and manager selection and then your underlying managers potentially in your portfolio are also making asset allocation decisions. So. You know, the challenge that we would, as I sort of alluded to, the challenge that we see around, around this is that you need to have a, a base framework and that's, you know, the, the context of which um, I've always thought about it and the ability to be able to then um, think about that in terms of the objectives that you're trying to achieve. I think one of the challenges when people talk about asset allocation, as you say, is that quite often um, people see it as a as a significant move every time you need to make a decision. And we don't see it in that manner, but you need to have a directional view that you want to build into and have strength in that conviction through time as opposed to looking at it on the basis of one week we're going to make a decision and buy Bitcoin and then the next week we're going to sell it because it drops, as an example. So you need some of that, um, as I said, duration in, the, in those views enable you to get the advantage of making the changes. How are your thoughts? Uh, I would agree with all that, and I think you framed it nicely. Everyone feels like they're an asset allocator because it's it's one of those things we've all got. You know, it's a barbecue chat, and we've all got a bit of skill in timing markets, etc. I think being honest, and, and Piers had this in his slides earlier, being honest about where you can truly add value, I think that's a useful starting point. Do we have a demonstrable track record in being able to do this? Can we show that? Okay, now let's exercise that skill. That's a really good starting point. I think the bit, and I was sort of highlighting this before, the environment right now is is challenged. And you just need more bodies to throw at it. If asset allocation is more difficult, you need to be innovative. You're using that broad church that Piers was talking about. You just need more bodies. Uh, and to, to really make it an environment where you feel you can add value. So I think it's resourcing is really important. Be honest about what you've got at your disposal. Think about where you think you can actually add value. And if you're going to go into that broader church and use a wider range of instruments, just make sure you've got the appropriate resourcing to make those decisions. Mm. In this environment where returns are harder to come by, um, and you know, I guess that's in part conventional wisdom moving forward as well, you can either go two ways with asset allocation. You can either be more frequent, almost become you know, a GTAA type approach, talking about what you were saying with Bitcoin, you know, trade in and out, looking for a lot of positions, hoping that a number of them will pay off or you can be more discretionary about it, taking a, a lesser number of high quality positions. Do you, each of you have a particular strong philosophy on this point? I agree with that and we're not, and I'm certainly not smart enough to do the Bitcoin one. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly take that more, you know, um, as I said, a longer directional view. You've always got to question it. I think one of the challenges at the moment when we sort of think about it is, um, there seems to be a lot of one way positioning across portfolios. So. It's not to say that we want to be contrarian, but are you either late to the party if you are going to position into that? Um, or, you know, is there another way that you can, you said, deliver the returns without necessarily potentially buying expensive assets? But I agree with you 100%, Michael. I mean, we're far more in that second camp rather than in the, you know, um, high frequency trading camp on, on AA. We just aren't good enough at it and we just don't think it adds value mm. for all the noise and costs. And now? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. It's, it comes back to where do you think you can actually add value. I've learnt over the years I'm no good 
at the short-term trading. There are obviously some people who are very good at it. I think a few of them showed up and read it a few weeks ago with a few of those, those uh, social media things, but it's not, it's not where I've been able to add value over my career. So I think being honest about where you can add value is very important. But also, don't be afraid to... I mean, what's, there's, I'll get this quote wrong. It's something like, there's decades when nothing happens and there's weeks when decades happen. If you're in that week, then don't be afraid to take the risk. Like, you've got to know where you think you can add value and be nimble enough and be at least speedy enough to actually get that risk deployed, make those decisions and get them done. Mm. That, was Lennon. That. That, Sorry. Was, that was Lennon, by the way. Um, Lennon was, was, that, was, that quote was from Lennon. Yeah. Just uh, on a that noted por portfolio manager. For <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, comrade. <laughs> well, I think just on that point there, from your comment there, Al, I think having a rationale for your views is also really important because if you want to create a view, and let's say emerging markets is, is one element, and, and, and people going into emerging markets have already rallied significantly over the course of um, 2020, and then the view to say, well, I'm going to go into emerging markets because they've gone up and because, you know, it's the trade. The element around that, I think, if you were going to do that, I'd imagine MLC, you'd have a really well-structured rationale as to why you want to go into emerging markets to be able to back that view. Now, even if that view turns out to be wrong, you've got a rationale in terms of your thought processes to why we're we making that decision, how we're we making it, and for what duration, and what are the catalysts in order for that to change. And I think that if you are looking at it from an asset allocation point of view, that's been one of the things that I've found really helpful for me over my career, is to really document that and think about it. And it doesn't have to be chapter and verse, and it doesn't need to take 12 months, but it does, again, set a framework, because quite often when you do that, then you're looking at, well, if I got this wrong, what implications are on the other side? And it just balances out that, mm. that concept. One of the th topics that came up uh, a couple of times during the presentations today is you know, maybe looking to become increasingly granular with investment calls. So, for example, the China equity market as opposed to emerging markets. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Obviously, in the context of managed accounts, one of the advantages is the ability to implement fairly quickly. Um, but are we trying to get too granular with some of these calls? Are they really asset allocation? Or is there perhaps a tipping point here that they probably really belong to a, an asset manager that has expertise maybe allocating between regions in the case of emerging markets or, or developed markets for that matter? Uh, are we just trying to uh, inherit too much of those decisions at the asset allocation level? Are there constraints with doing that? I mean, the average investment committee that we deal with maybe meets once a quarter, they might meet more frequently, but it seems that some of those decisions may require an almost hands-on, day-to-day perspective. I just wonder about your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. I mean, we have a broad EM strategy um, for our sort of our multi-asset portfolios, and within our global equity portfolio, we run an Asian strategy, so um, alongside our, our broad EM. Um, because we've got a view on, uh, on Asia and, and sort of the growth coming through. But we don't have a China strategy or an India strategy mm. in that context. So I think that that's, that's right. And um, again, you know, some of that granularity, you can actually lose a benefit. So I agree with you on that front for sure, Mike. Mm. How do you yeah, no, exactly the same. When, I mean, when you invest, you invest in risks you're going to get paid for. Well, the same, it's the same with active risk. Invest in active risk, you believe you can add value. So it comes back to that being honest, and we talk, everyone's talked about that already, but at least be honest around where you feel you can add value, and if you can demonstrate that, then sure, take the risk. But we're, we're getting incredibly granular, and which, we, we tend to think of it as being innovative rather than sort of granular. We don't feel like we're going outside the box, we just think there's different ways, given that, as I said before, there's nothing on the other side, we need to find ways of getting some of these things ourselves, customising them. So we'll, not so much for SMAs, but within things like some of our own funds, we'll build specific equity baskets that pay us a coupon, we'll wrap volatility around it such that we can't lose money and get a synthetic miner's bond or something like that. There's all these innovative ways we can think about trying to get these things into our portfolios. For me, and it's exactly the same as Piers just said, as long as we're comfortable that's where we think we can add value, then it's something we're willing to do. And in this current environment, it feels like something we sort of need to do. And now just pursuing that point, on, with regard to managed accounts, what are the constraints you come up against? I mean, managed accounts are probably a more recent phenomenon that you've observed. You've got a long, we all have a long history working with managed funds, but managed accounts offer advantages, certainly from a, a, an advisory model portfolio. But what are the constraints that we have to be cognizant of that make perhaps implementation very difficult, very expensive, perhaps? Um, you know, share some thoughts on that. 
No, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a compromise. There's no doubt you're right. I mean, it, it, in simplest form, you're, you're limited or constrained by the funds that are on the platform. That's your first constraint. But then the democratisation of investing, I mean, there's so many ETFs and there's so many listed vehicles we can use. So the capacity to get a lot of the exposures we need, uh, particularly with what's going on now, with, thanks to BlackRock and people like that, there are a lot of things we can actually get uh, exposure to. So the compromise is not as profound as it probably used to be a few years ago. Uh, but that said, there are around derivatives and things like that, there are things which are just a, they're a blanket trade-off. So you look at the, we look at our internal fund and we look at the managed account and we think, okay, what's the most appropriate trade-off here we can make to get the nature of that uh, exposure in uh, and are we happy to make that trade-off? So an example would be something like currency. So currency, it's, it's harder for us to trade it on the platform, obviously, mm -hmm. than it is in our own funds. So if we want to, for instance, take some more foreign currency but we don't want as much US dollar, well, we can use a value manager. Global value managers tend to have a lot less US dollars in their portfolio, so if we want to do that, then we can have an unhedged uh, exposure through a value manager rather than through a growth manager, those sorts of things. Mm. So it's just being, it's being a bit innovative and trying to find where we can actually get that trade-off best mm. represented. But you're right, there's compromise. And Piers, extending that conversation into the, the realm of alternatives, um, are there alternatives you'd love to be able to incorporate but just can't because of the, the inherent nature of the beast? Yeah, and I think um, we've been worked with a number of managers. I think probably the, the liquidity element of platforms. So I think it's a platform issue. I'm not sure if there's any platform people here, but um, platforms talk about that they can deliver on everything, but then ultimately um, liquidity then becomes sort of the be-all and end-all in terms of that the conversation. So, you know, in the environment where you're seeing, say, industry super funds and the like have a vast or a significant amount of assets in, um, you know, illiquid assets, um, in alternatives, so you know it does make it a challenge in that in that sense. So I think one of the things from a managed account point of view is the the inability of platforms to be able to administer. Now they're doing more around the private label. They're doing more around um, the ability to quarantine um, managed account portfolios for particular groups, um, and that's enabled you know groups such as ourselves being able to to you know um, have some exposure. But it is it is a challenge, and then. You've then got the second element associated with it is for clients, if they leave your managed account portfolio, um, and let's say they're, you know, their portfolio is in a, an IM as opposed to a PDS, then they have to be a wholesale investor, and if they're not a wholesale investor having got into your portfolio, then there's, it's got to sit on um, as a standalone investment on, on the wrap. So there are some sort of mechanic issues that um, make it a challenge to hold um, illiquid assets and um, IMs as well for retail investors through a managed account. I think they're solvable, but I think that you know there, there does need to be some some aspects from particularly again from platforms because they're doing the administration. Less so probably in ours well because they have their own um, administrative vehicle. But certainly the three platforms we're on haven't solved that issue, and in some respects don't want to, which I think is you know not great for the uh, for the industry. Mm. Well, let's move on to the here and now, second half of this uh, session. Um, Al, you talked about bonds and uh, you know the, the historically easy switch at uh, various stages of the investment cycle between growth and defensive and how that, that decision is far trickier. What does that mean in terms of portfolio construction looking forward? Uh, is there a third leg to that conversation that you can look at that can perhaps try and fulfil part of the role? Uh, how do you build a portfolio, particularly in a low interest rate environment? It's a theme that we were talking about last year. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. That's it. the first, I think the easy thing is you just end up owning less nominal bonds. That's the easy thing. Uh, outside of that, now how do I, what do I now use as a defensive mechanism? And it is, we're coming back to the similar theme, but it's, it's this broad church just be willing to look for different ways. I think, was it BlackRock, I think it was James, saying they've got Chinese bonds in their portfolio. Well, we've done the same thing. You get a government bond that's paying you 3% yield, which was 2% as of you know, three, four months ago, it was 2% more than anyone else in a developed market. That made sense. So just being a little bit more uh, innovative in where we can get that defensive component. The other, and that's in the carry side, the other bit to sort of consider is just pure defensiveness. How do I actually get pure defensiveness in? Is it through currency? Is it through volatility? I mean, trying to think of ways of doing those types of things. Now, you're right. It is a little bit more of a challenge in the managed, managed accounts world. There are vehicles that do it. You can go and buy a big CTF. You know, there, there are ways you can get those types of things into your portfolio. Uh, it's just understanding, again, the sort of trade-off 
uh, around your growth versus your defensive. Mm. And Piers, what's your thoughts? How do you respond to this low interest rate environment? What sort of strategies are you trying to incorporate to sup not only, I guess, supplement risk management within the portfolio, but also that return requirement? Yeah, so we've, we've certainly increased our alternatives exposure and within that, what I'd sort of classify as defensive vaults. So those that are generally trying to provide a higher running yield and they may be in different market segments. I mean, infrastructure is an example. In our view, yes, it's obviously got some interest rate sensitivity associated with it, but long term um, cash flows that you know are CPI linked quite often in, in that context. So, um, and we like the, the nature of the asset as well. So there are certainly some, some areas where we've been going into on that basis. Um, you know, equity still, from our point of view, um, provide, you know, a very good, strong, strong yield. And, you know, BHP's result's a good example there. I mean, even though, you know, miners aren't, they've got their record cash flow. So I think that even equities in the context of, of, of yield can be also accretive for, for investors. Um, you know, like our, we're certainly as underweight as we can be in terms of our, our bonds exposure. Um, you know, we've got a more flexible bond um, exposure across our, our managers where we utilise that just to said reduce some of that duration risk. But you know, I think it is a, you know, a challenge and I think that one of the aspects from an asset allocation point of view that potentially we may all have to face into through 2021 if yields continue to go as the way they've been going over the last three months is that you know, the fixed income component of our portfolios could generate a negative return. So for your, call it retirees or for your very conservative based clients that might have a that might result in a difficult conversation because they haven't seen that since really 1994 and so you know I think it's an important aspect that you may mention Mike because you do need to deal into that situation where nominal bonds could give a negative return and that's sort of um, not intuitive for mm. for many retail investors. Mm. Al coming back to you and I guess in the interest of time probably the last point from me. Uh, inflation or deflation? Deflation seems to be falling out of favour at the moment, but if we look out over the next five years or so, uh, which is your, your greater concern? Oh, the greater concern is inflation. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the scenarios process that we run, deflation, there's still deflationary scenarios, just feels like the probability of those is lessened given the way governments are behaving. So governments and central banks have coordinated globally to do their best to get rid of deflation for the last 10 years, almost 20 years. Uh, and they've been successful. Now, well, I think we'll start to see infl inflation starting to rise. It's been called transient. I think that'll become more structural in time, and we won't have time to go into the reasons for that. But we're definitely more worried about inflation. But as I said, the good thing about that is it's not terribly expensive to hedge against inflation in your portfolios. We haven't seen it. I remember it. I remember I was trading bonds in '94 when inflation suddenly reared its head again, and that was a, uh, a learning experience, is the best way to describe it. But it, once, it, once, inflation, once inflation surfaces, it does tend to be quite... Uh, persistent, and it wouldn't be a surprise if that's where we end up in the next five years. Mm. Piers, inflation, deflation? I would say it's a slight increase in inflation. I, I wouldn't say it's going to go, you know, gangbusters, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, um, you know, we have had, you know, deflationary pressures in multiple parts of the um, global economy, so I think they have some level of inflation is good, and I think central banks, I think, have changed their mantras. We know they're going from really forward guidance to actually being in the eye of the storm before they make changes. So I think in the context of that, you know, central banks are on hold and they want to see it come through because we've seen through 08, 09, through the QE, we didn't see inflation rear its head as well. And, you know, if we look at the moment, um, you know, in the US, still 10 million plus people unemployed. We're not seeing any wage growth come through. You're seeing pockets in certain sectors of the, the economy. So I think it's a, a while off yet. And I think just in terms of... We spent a fair bit of time more recently just in regards should we add tips to our portfolio and these sorts of things, but the long duration of um, ILBs and the break-even points, we, we haven't got there yet and we think that there are other ways you can manage that. And if we do get in that context, you know, we'll see probably the nominal, nominal end of the curve sell off. So, you know, it's probably a negative from, from that perspective as well. So I think that's a really tough one actually um, dealing with it for, mm. for investors um, over the next little while. Yep. Certainly that's our view. Well, look, we might, we've got time for, I think, a couple of questions. So uh, if uh, you want to put your hand up or yell out and we'll get a microphone around to you. Anyone? I have a question which grew out of a couple of the answers, which is, I mean, the title of the session is um, asset allocation. What it actually means is asset class allocation. Um, but what, what, constitute, what is starting to constitute an asset class, you know, a, a unit of decision making? Um, for portfolio managers. 
Um, you know, what, we're getting away from, you know, global equities, away from just US equities, down into quite small I mean, um, the, the, se segments. That's the question I think I, I covered with regard to uh, how granular should the asset allocation decision be, but who'd like to take that one on uh, well, Yeah, I'm happy to start it and the peers finish, but it's good. It's, whatever you add to your portfolio has to play a role, so everything's got to play a role. So I don't mind what that looks like. Whatever the exposure looks like to play that role, I don't mind. So we tend not to sort of, for our team, it's not so much constraining it to, oh, we can only buy this or this. If we can create an exposure that facilitates a certain uh, outcome for our portfolios, then we'll do it. So I was sort of trying to give you the example of creating a miner's bond. Well, we're not going to get, as was just articulated, we're not going to get anything from a lot of the credit that we're trying to buy. There's very little running yield. We can create an equity dividend stream and turn it into a bond using volatility. We'll use that as an exposure. So is it an asset class? Absolutely not. But it's an exposure we see as playing a specific role. So for us, there's no boundaries if we can find something that plays a specific role that something else used to play. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you, and thank you to the two panellists. And ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in saying thank you to them. Thanks very much, gentlemen. I think that was a, an excellent session. Um, Interesting. We're going to go again from from the, the 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 sort of the big picture down to the next 12 months. So we're jumping into one of our our sessions that leads up to our final final uh, panel, which is uh, growth in 2021. And um, our presenter uh, for 15 minutes as uh, an asset consultant to give us his views um, is Brad Matthews of BMIS. Now, Brad's uh, had over 30 years' experience in uh, a range of financial services roles, but most interestingly, when you look at his, his bio, uh, he's, he's edited a newsletter known as Plain English Economics for the past 24 years that's read by secondary students studying economics. So I'm all for plain English. I might have a chat to you, Brad, about whether you can give my son some, some personal tutorage for economics because he needs it. Please welcome Brad Matthews. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alan, and good afternoon, everyone. And since it's only 15 minutes before lunch, I will we'll try and keep it as um, plain English as, as I can. Um, before we sort of talk about where the growth opportunities are, I think it needs to be acknowledged that 2021, that the number of unknowns is is so much greater uh, than um, any normal year. Um, the unknowns around the vaccine, uh, the, the virus itself, the unknowns around the magnitude of the policy response that we had last year, how that will all play out, and increasingly the unknowns about the geopolitical situation, um, particularly around China. Um, they're all, I think, larger unknowns than we would normally experience. So I think the margin for uncertainty in 2021 needs to be acknowledged that it is, it is higher than normal. Um, I will uh, apologise starting off with a, um, a view on inflation because it, it has been covered a lot, um, but it is very important it, that the maintenance of low inflation really does underpin equity valuations, but it also provides the basis on which we've seen monetary policy and fiscal policy pretty much unconstrained over, over recent years. Uh, if we didn't have low inflation, the, the, the scope for that policy, policy stimulus would be much more restricted. Um, so anything that threatens that environment of low inflation um, is, is a particularly important factor. Um, now, I've got a, a chart on the screen there looking at um, the relationship between the Australian money supply and Australian uh, non-tradable inflation. It's fairly uh, unfashionable these days to, to compare uh, money supply growth and inflation. It's sort of a, uh, an approach that's gone out of favour to a large degree. But you can see from the chart that the, the coincidence of money supply growth and inflation is quite strong. Um, and as you know, we have had a pickup in the money supply growth quite markedly over recent months uh, as a result of the big fiscal stimulus being financed by um, central bank bond buying. Uh, so it, it does remain to be seen whether uh, that relationship continues to hold, uh, but nonetheless you would have to say that that, that is one of the preconditions of inflation. Uh, it, it's interesting that sort of a, increasingly the view has become that inflation 
uh, will be more of an issue in 2021, because uh, that view is actually quite at odds with the central bank view, um, where they pretty much are saying that the inflation will remain low, near, near absent, uh, due to the fact that we do have spare capacity in the labour market. Um, and that's pretty much the only reason they give uh, for, the, for their views around the maintenance of low inflation. But we know from the 1970s and 1980s, where you, you also had a lot of spare capacity in the labour market, but you still had inflation. So it's not necessarily a, a guarantee that we won't um, see inflation re-emerge uh, of some magnitude uh, in 2021. Just looking at that capacity issue in the labour market, the chart on, on the screen at the moment shows the current job vacancies um, as a percentage of the size of the, the labour market. Um, so quite remarkably, we actually have more job vacancies today than we did pre-crisis. Pre um, so it does put a bit of a question mark over this view that there's a huge amount of spare capacity in the labour market. Certainly, unemployment is elevated, um, but there is a degree a frictional unemployment that's much greater than it was 12 months ago. And we, we've heard anecdotal uh, evidence around the agricultural sector, for example, not being able to get labour. Um, uh, I think it's also worth noting that two of the largest pools of relatively cheap labour uh, have, have been uh, somewhat decimated in terms of the backpackers and also foreign students. So <clears throat> people who were willing to work at quite low wages are no longer coming into the economy. Um, they've been replaced by, I guess, young Australians who would have travelled abroad, but their willingness to work uh, for lower wages uh, would be probably somewhat restricted. They, they may have been happy to work in London at a bar for £6 an hour, but probably not quite so happy to work in Australia at the minimum wage rate at 7 11 or so on. So um, there's, there, there's that aspect to, to wage costs as well. Um, so I, I would question the degree to which you can rely on elevated unemployment to really control or remove that inflationary risk. And I'm certainly in the, uh, in the camp, I guess, that inflation may well surprise on the upside. And when you combine that with the, the, the strong level of spending, uh, again, it's quite remarkable that we've got retail spending so much higher now than it was 12 months ago, despite that, um, that incidence of, of elevated unemployment. Um, certainly, the, the, the fiscal stimulus has been successful in driving expenditure. Um, the chart shows the, the, the rate of growth in, in retail sales, but also the household savings ratio. You can see the, the extent to which the household savings ratio has been elevated. Um, so what that suggests is there's still capacity within the household sector to keep spending uh, for some time. So that creates, um, I, I guess, an ongoing source of demand pressure, which may, may force inflation higher. So I guess in, in terms of uh, what does that mean for growth in 2021, uh, certainly on the defensive side of, of the portfolios, uh, I'd be encouraging people to put, push away from duration. Uh, and I think we, we've heard that, that theme uh, expressed uh, this morning. And in that defensive part of the portfolio, having a bigger role for absolute return strategies and even using some of the, the cash and fixed interest bucket to move into alternatives, um, just to try and keep the prospective return above the level of inflation. Uh, so we want our defensive investors to at least maintain purchasing power. Uh, and I think there's less risk of that in absolute return and alternatives than there is in longer term bond duration uh, based investments. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Looking at the, uh, the growth side of the, the equation, and it's very apparent when you look at what's happened over the last 12 months, um, the degree of disparity uh, across equity markets in, in the different sectors. So certainly uh, equity markets have held up pretty well in aggregate uh, over the last year, uh, but there's certain parts of the equity market that appear relatively cheap uh, and other parts that appear relatively expensive. And particularly we do, we do get that upward pressure on inflation, which then turns into upward pressure on longer term interest rates. So I think we can expect some sort of reversion in those trends. Um, so we're particularly looking at infrastructure and, and property, um, the more defensive end of the, the equity market, um, utilities as being areas which are probably a safer bet. Uh, they're still offering relatively good yield. Uh, if there is some inflation, they have CPI-linked cash flows. Uh, so we do see that as a bit of a sweet spot for 2021. I think those areas have really been left behind the rest of the market. There's been a lot of, a lot of interest in the high PE, high, high growth stocks for a period of time. As we got the vaccine announcement, there was a lot of interest in retail stocks and more cyclical stocks, but that true defensive end of the market, I think will become quite attractive, uh, both for people looking to have a, 
I guess, a more fundamental um, view of equities, but also people shifting from defensive investments into more growth style. Um, so that, they'd be the two areas probably that we'd look to to bias in, in an overweight sense. I've got a couple of examples there on the, the bottom of the chart of um, shopping centre REITs as just an example uh, of the style of investing where you haven't seen those valuations come back very far at all uh, since they were sold down quite dramatically in that March period. Um, so you can see there yields on, on offer. If we do get a normalised dividend payout, um, and you do need to, to adjust this for some capital raises through the last 12 months as well, um, but if, if retail sales do return, uh, then presumably rent collections in shopping centres return and, and all the evidence suggests that in, in the big high quality centres that's, that's happening. So it wouldn't be inconceivable that over the next 12 months some of those yields start pushing up to 8% if you don't get any change in the, um, in, in the share price of those vehicles. So either the assumption of the yields being normalised is incorrect or we do get some price growth. Um, so we, we see that as, as a pretty attractive area. I think you can go through the whole infrastructure asset class and come up with similar uh, sorts of scenarios where normalisation of cash flows will start to make these assets quite quite attractive in a, in a relative sense. Um, on the, on the currency side uh, as well, we'd also be looking to be quite active with currency, um, uh, not so much as an area of growth, but perhaps increasingly use it as a, a, a defensive part of the portfolio. I think the rise in the Australian dollar does create opportunities to start using unhedged exposures as a bit of a uh, downward protection. Uh, so the, the, the fortunate aspect of being in Australia as, as an Australian investor, it is a pro-growth currency. So typically being unhedged does limit the downside volatility. So as that dollar comes up, <clears throat> looking for opportunities to build in some protection by having uh, some unhedged exposure in that equity portfolio as well. I'll just um, finish up with a final slide um, just to highlight the fact that I think we need to be on the lookout for imbalances over 2021. Um, we've seen such unprecedented stimulus being applied to economies that would, it would be remarkable if everything, <coughs> excuse me, just came into a big equilibrium after that. I think there will be imbalances uh, coming through. Um, and I've got a, the chart there shows just the, the spending by Australians on consumer imports. Um, and you can see it's sort of rocketed up from seven and a half billion a month to, t to 10 billion a month over the last six months. Um, so that's playing out all around the world in different ways and, and certainly from Australia's perspective our trade accounts are very strong so it's not presenting any macro risks at this point in time but there would be emerging economies where a similar sort of trend would actually cause at, at certain points quite significant imbalances. Um, so I think we just need to be careful about uh, assuming that things will, will go on as normal when we've had such disruption, such disruption to supply chains and the, the normal workings of economies, there's going to be things that fall out. Um, and I guess the more vulnerable the economy is and, and, and the more reliant it is on foreign capital, uh, the, the more risky it may, be, may become over 2021. So I might finish it there. I know we've got a Q&A session on some of this later. Uh, so I don't think we're taking questions now, but um, thanks for your attention and enjoy lunch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brad. I look forward to exploring some of those ideas at the, uh, the end of, of today in our final session. So I hope you enjoyed lunch. I thought it was lovely. Uh, COVID safe as it was. And we'll move into our, our next panel discussion for the day, which is around the best vehicles for achieving managed account portfolio objectives. Now, uh, in its esteemed panel, I'll leave Dominic uh, who is the, the moderator to introduce the panel. But Dominic McCormick is well known to many of you. He's had an extensive career in financial services. We're in a room full of financial service professionals. If you really want to read the bios, they're available through, uh, through the QR code. So without further ado, Dominic, over to you. Yes, I <coughs> I did ask Alan not to read the bio because it was a bit out of date. Um, it, went, it talked about 33 years experience and I've just realised that this is my 37th year um, in the investment industry. Um, back to my first job at, at AMP 37 years ago, back when it had a, a good reputation. <laughs> Toby, they're not a sponsor, are they? Uh, Oh, oh I, didn't, I didn't see them there, but uh, sorry. 
that was a long time ago anyway. But uh, for this topic, we have a, uh, some great panellists uh, to discuss. And I'm not going to go through their full buyers. We have Chris Meyer, the Director of Listed Products at Pinnacle. Evan Metcalf of ETF Securities, Head of Product. And Nathan Lim, Head of Wealth Management Research at Morgan Stanley. And with fancy titles like that, you know that they've got the right experience and qualifications to discuss uh, this important topic. So if they would like to come up and um, take their spots. I mean, best vehicles for achieving managed account portfolio objectives. I mean, today, it will be skewed towards managed vehicles uh, because that's how a lot of these portfolios are being built today. Even though direct shares is obviously uh, has been part of these types of portfolios for some time and is probably where managed accounts started. And we're trying to have also have a look at you know, what's changing in this space and what the, what the future looks like. But we're going to start with a sort of big picture question. And uh, Nathan, in particular, has uh, got a slide and some, uh, to talk about this one. You know, where do passive exposures, and especially ETFs, fit in managed accounts? Um, There's no real point asking Evan on this as an ETF provider. <laughs> He'll say a lot, and probably no point asking Chris as an active uh, manager supporter. He'll say uh, not very much. But Nathan is out there putting together uh, portfolios using uh, active and passive vehicles, and he'll pr initially provide some insight into how he's approaching that. Let's see. Perfect. Um, thanks, Dom. So I think there's just one slide. I was I was asked to sort of start today's discussion, again, just sort of as my role as head of health, wealth management research, is just how do we put models together for our wealth management clients? And the very first thing I just want to make very clear is that at Morgan Stanley, we're very agnostic, right? We really don't think that active or passive is necessarily better. It's horses for courses. At any point in the economic cycle, or any time specifically market conditions, really is a better indicator of when you actually want to be using an active or a passive uh, in, uh, instrument. Now, as far as we know, and again, maybe somebody can correct me about this later, I think we're the only firm in Australia that actually has a active passive framework that is predictive. So we actually put together a series of indicators to actually get some insight into whether or not market conditions right now are more conducive for an active manager or a passive manager. And this is really, the slide shows you, is our active passive framework. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the, the deep details on how, the, how it actually works. But effectively, what we're doing is we're looking at market fundamentals. We're looking at interest rates. We're looking at manager dispersion of returns. We're looking at fund flows to sort of get a gauge, a sense of what is the sort of state of the market. And the simple way to sort of think about this when you aggregate it all together is sort of like a rising tide lifts all ships, right? So we've heard that saying many, many times. If you know that the market, for example, has got tight dispersion of returns, it's really hard for an active manager to beat their peers if everybody's doing the same thing. You know what, just get yourself an ETF. Alternatively, if you've got a wide dispersion of returns, you've got a very sort of confused market in terms of signals, then that's a great time for active managers to step in. And so that is one of, one of our four key pillars in terms of how we build our portfolios. We're agnostic between active and passive, and we very much let the market sort of predict and tell us where we should be sort of positioning our portfolios. And just as a final point, for the last two or three years before the uh, COVID crisis, we were very much in the passive camp. Since then, we've been aggressively moving towards increasing more active allocation in our portfolios. Just as a follow-up question, I mean, has, has the increased range uh, and granularity of the ETF spectrum made it easier to build these portfolios, or do you think it's even gone, gone too far? No, it's absolutely made it a lot easier, especially in Australia. Now that we're up to about 300-odd ETFs, it's fantastic. However, what we have got access to on our global platform is that we actually also shop from the global universe. So there's about 3,000 ETFs offshore, and there are little idiosyncratic differences, like the best example I can think of is there, there's a, an iShares um, ETF, uh, their Europe ETF. Uh, 
that is about a quarter cheaper if you buy it in London as opposed to buying this, the, the same one here in Australia. So it's just a little arbitrage that you can pick up by just looking outside the rest of the world. Now that's not open to all platform providers. The range of ETFs from iShares already are very good and we're very happy to be using them. But where you've got the ability to sort of reach outside of Australia, there's lots of choice out there. And I think that's a key element to building robust portfolios. You want to be able to express as much of your investment view as granular as you can get. Evan, do you, do you have any? Yeah, I think just to add on to that, that same point, I think having the, the additional granularity that you have these days allows people to, I guess, take a, an active decision more at a portfolio level. So instead of going right down to sort of single stock analysis and individual assets and, and building their portfolio from the ground up, they can look at things like sectors, things like regions, and use the, the tools available in the, in the ETF universe to, to construct a portfolio in that way, which is still essentially active, but it's not active right down to the, the base level. Yeah, maybe if, if I can chip in, I mean, I'm, I'm here to fly the flag a little bit for ETFs, but also for active ETFs, actively managed ETFs. You know, Pinnacle is an issue of, of actively managed ETFs, and I would say that's probably where the choice is not good enough yet for, you know, advisors in the room. If you do like to build client portfolios using ETFs, but you also like to mix passive and active in an ETF format. There's only about 20 actively managed ETFs in Australia today of the 300 total ETFs. But I reckon that's going to change a lot this year. And so I think, you know, I'm optimistic that if you are an advisor and you're building portfolios for your clients using listed funds, particularly ETFs, you'll have more choice of actively managed ETFs this year. And I think that could be a tipping point for just the general usage of ETFs in client portfolios, that you will have more choice um, of good quality, you know, active managers that are available for you in an ETF wrapper. Because, you know, e even Nathan interchangeably uses the term ETF with passive. But actually an ETF is just a, it's just a wrapper for a managed fund. It could be active, it could be passive, it just happens to be quoted on an exchange. And so if that's the way you like to build your client's portfolios is on exchange, then, you know, and you want to use passive and active, then, you know, you need more choice of actively managed ETFs in order to build those portfolios. Yeah. Nathan, do you have a view on that? If the use of active ETFs versus traditional unlisted funds? No, I'm, ver I'm very supportive of anything that reduces the friction between a client's funds being deployed into the market. Um, I think there's a lot of complexity that we all face in this industry. A lot of it is self-imposed because of technology, but also because of regulation. But I think ETFs, that wrapper, that structure is very efficient, is very transparent, is very efficient. And so I find that that more managers going from that unlisted sort of managed fund space to that listed ETF, ETF space, it just helps to make things easier for clients. It doesn't change the manager's performance, whether you put yourself in an ETF wrapper, but at least it's easier access for customers, which is ultimately what we're here to do. And I suppose still on active ETFs, the Magellan sort of hybrid structure, is that, is that the way you see the future, Chris, in, the, in that space? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know, you know how many in the audience follow this. It's a, it's a little bit technical, but essentially, you know, Magellan's pioneered the structure whereby you can now essentially list an, an unlisted managed fund, exactly the same unit class as you would have invested in in the managed fund. It just happens to be quoted on exchange. I, I think it's a game changer for the industry. I, I'm not sure a buyer of that ETF necessarily cares. You know, it's maybe slightly beneficial to them knowing that it's exactly the same unit that they would have bought if they'd bought it in an unlisted fund. But for, for like issuers like Pinnacle or Magellan or anyone in the room who's an asset manager, um, you know, just knowing that you can use exactly the same, say, let's say it's the flagship fund of your, of your uh, strategy and it's got a long track record and it's got all the, you know, research ratings from the research houses, it's on all the platform slots and you're taking that exact same unit and you're putting it up on an exchange that, you know, users like yourselves who like to use listed funds can then use that fund, that unit, to build their clients' portfolios it's just a, it's a simpler concept to understand. And so I think we'll see a lot more of that this year. And I think the other thing we'll see, and this is maybe slightly off topic, but 
we're still very new and active ETFs. You know, Magellan pioneered it five years ago. Five years is a, is a very short time span for any industry. Um, the US has only started it this year. And so I think globally we'll see more and more education and rhetoric about actively managed ETFs. And I think that'll just, you know, more conferences like this will talk about it. And so I think it'll start to become part of everyday language um, with financial advisors and brokers. Is it a product structure that more suits the bigger brand, brand name managers rather than sort of more boutique type groups? No, not necessarily. I mean, I, you know, there's 5,000 managed funds, there's 20 active ETFs. You know, there's a huge number of those 5,000 that could, you know, fill up the 20 active ETFs. And if you look at the, <clears throat> if you look at the pipeline of product at ChiX and the ASX, I think there's something like 30 to 40 funds that should come on stream just before June of this year, active ETFs. And so I think you'll see just a lot more of it, not just from big brand name asset managers, but from boutique asset managers. Yeah, I was going to say, I think just from, a, from an issuer perspective, there's, there's definitely a, an extra overhead in terms of costs associated with running market making and running all the, the various operations and things. So I think, um, I think issuers need to be really aware of what their target audience is for the active listed version of the fund versus whether they're just getting it to the same, the same individuals that are able to access on platforms already. We might move on to licks and lits, which... Um sort of has got a bit of controversy and a bit of a battering over the last couple of years, um, which I got a bit of as well. But <laughs> um, Chris, and I, and I actually have the view that licks and lits are actually hard to incorporate in managed accounts the way most people are trying to do it. They don't, they don't benchmark very well against sort of traditional managed funds, so it does create some issues. But perhaps, Chris, first, what role do you see for licks and lit 